physical therapy has a very close place uh, in my heart. I've uh, done my fair share of physical therapy and kept physical therapists busy over the past 10 years or so. Um, and I know that you all have some experience, I believe, with some physical therapy. So if you would, um, just raise a hand if you have ever done physical therapy. All right, look around. Good. Now put your hands down. Uh, now, if you're willing, uh, who is currently doing physical therapy? Anybody currently doing physical therapy? Yeah, yeah raise your cast up in the air. Who knew? Uh, the, word, the world of physical therapy, I, I really appreciate it. I think the world of physical therapy is a good world. I think they do some great things, uh, very helpful things. Um, we have friends who are physical therapists. Our brother-in-law is a physical therapist. Uh, we go to him all the time with questions and things going on with our own health. Um, and physical therapy is good. You know, you have a surgery and you need to regain all that, that range of motion or that strength. So you go to six or eight weeks of physical therapy. Uh, or you get injured and you've got to go to physical therapy to make that body part work again. Maybe like it used to or hopefully just as good as new. Um, I like a lot of the toys that physical therapists have in their office. I love those colored balls uh, that you're supposed to do exercises on, but they're fun to play with. Um, I, I like the, the balance boards, or those half spherical balance boards. Um, I haven't gotten the hang of the one with the little wedge that you're supposed to balance on. I have not mastered that one yet. Um, and then they have the slide boards where you put on the, the cloth booties and you act like you're skiing or skating back and forth. That's one of my favorites. Um, I, I also have a lot, all the colors of the rubber bands uh, when, I was, when I've done therapy. And I, I think I did enough therapy that I had every color. I had the yellow and the green and the red and the gray and the black and I'm sure there was another color. And we had them tied to doorknobs around uh, our house uh, and uh, tied to posts and other things to be able to use them. And you know, seeing those all over the place, it, it reminds me that physical therapy is not just an appointment that you go to twice a week for six weeks. You know, physical therapy is really about a set of exercises that we keep on doing. We've been talking about faithfulness on and off uh, for quite a while. Uh, faithfulness is something and, that shows up throughout the Bible. And that's why it seems to come up every so often. Uh, faithfulness is hundreds of times throughout the Bible. You know, faithful to God, faithful to in relationships, faithful to the things that God tells us to do, faithfulness to uh, the things that God has done, faithful to the call that we've been given, faithfulness in all kinds of different ways. We even ran up against faithfulness uh, last week when we were looking at the book of Joshua, when we were looking at the ways that God was calling his people to live, and we came up against this this idea of faithfulness because there's so much at stake in a relationship with God. You know, when we're looking at Joshua, and we've been looking at Joshua for the past number of weeks, this, this whole issue of faithfulness comes up. And what's interesting about it is that it's, it's not about just doing the right thing or following the rules or doing it because it's a good thing to do. And the whole context, the whole picture of the book of Joshua is that God is leading his people into a certain place. And while it's totally real, and it's totally historical, and it's, it's tangible, and it's geographical, that's only part of what God's doing. You know, certainly these people are moving into a new land, they're having a new home, they're, they're living a new life, they're inhabiting this new world. But when God created this promised land, and the hope of the promised land, it was also God was creating what it looked like and felt like and tasted like to be in a relationship with God. Because never before had these people been in a place that was so peaceful and so spacious and so rich and so good. And once they got there, God's plan was for them to feel all of a sudden like, oh, this is what it's supposed to be like where we're in a relationship with God. There's, there's peace, and there's, there's space, and there's vitality. And overall, that's what the relationship with God is designed to be. Yeah. 
So when this whole idea of faithfulness comes up to these people, it's faithfulness within a relationship with God. You know, what does it look like to be faithful in a relationship with God? Not because there's a list of things that we're supposed to do, but because this is the relationship with God that we're designed to live. Is that going to make sense? Okay, good. Because we got to get that before we get to the rest. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So, one of the questions, though, that comes up is, well, what, what does faithfulness look like? Because I mean, that's a big term. Like, just be faithful. Well, what, what do I do? You know, what, what are the tasks? What do I, uh, how long does it take? Uh, what do I have to do to actually be faithful? How do I know when I've arrived at faithful? How do I, when do I get a name tag that says, you are faithful? I mean, how do we know when we've, when we've gotten there? What does it look like to even get there? And that's, that's a big question. And I think the book of Joshua, especially in this chapter, chapter 23 that we're looking at today, it really gives us kind of a physical therapy sort of response to this. It gives us a set of exercises that we can keep on doing to approach faithfulness and to be on a journey toward faithfulness. Uh, the place is interesting where all this comes up. Uh, the kids got a taste of that. Uh, it's, it's the speech that Joshua gives. And it's kind of like his farewell speech. It's kind of like, we've done all these things, so I've lived this life, we're here now, and I'm sending you out, and I'm done. But this is my encouragement to you, that my charge to you as I go. And so here's you know, some of these exercises that Joshua gives to these people so that they might throughout their lives be faithful. So here's how he starts. You have seen, talking to all the leaders and all the people of Israel, you have seen everything the Lord your God has done for you during my lifetime. The Lord your God has fought for you against your enemies. I have allotted you as your homeland all the land of the nations yet unconquered, as well as the land of those we have already conquered, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. The land will be yours, for the Lord your God will himself drive out all the people living there now. You will take possession of their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. Does that sound at all familiar? Have you heard any of those words? If you've been in the last number of weeks, any of that sort of familiar? Yeah, it was familiar to the people too. And on the one hand, and we, we read that, we hear it, and we think, haven't we been through this before? Like, haven't they heard this hundreds of times? They've heard the promise. They've heard the promise again. They've entered the land. They lived all this stuff. They saw all this. This is not new. You know, they've experienced it all. They've seen it all. They've walked through it all. They crossed the Jordan River. They saw the battles. They saw the walls of Jericho fall. They saw the battles in the south and the north. They went everywhere. They got their land. They know all this. So why is he telling them? I mean, if they already know it, if they've already seen it, experienced it, why do they need to hear it again? That's exercise number one. Repeating, remembering what God has done. Uh, this is remember. I wonder if repeat is even a better word. It, we need to remember it, but we also need to repeat it. Because we know the more we repeat things, the more we remember things, the more they stick with us. You know, if, if we don't repeat things, those, that space will be taken up with something else. If we don't create those memories, that, those memories will be replaced by something else. So if we remember, if we repeat the things that God has done, then we're more apt for those things to stick with us. You know, remember, people, that the river was impossible to cross, yet God brought you across. Remember that Jericho was impossible to defeat, yet you defeated them. Remember all these things that happened. Don't forget that these things happened. A bit later in Joshua, he says this in, in the same speech. Deep in your hearts, you know that every promise of the Lord your God has come true. Not a single one has failed. In order for us to remember the things that God has done, we've got to keep repeating it, memorizing it, and retelling it, and constantly revisiting the things that God has done. So if it feels like we've heard it before, if it feels like we've told it before, that's okay. We have. And that needs to stick with us, and that's how it does. You know how they say sometimes that uh, it takes ten compliments to overcome one insult? Or it takes you know, ten nice things to overcome one mean thing? I wonder if it takes 
10 times remembering to overcome one moment of discouragement. Or it takes 10 memories of God's faithfulness to overcome one of our uh, forgetting or hopelessness about something. I mean, it takes a lot to build up enough that we can then overcome the times that we all face of wondering what's going on and God, where are you? Because God, you've done all these things, so let's repeat them, let's revisit them, let's remember them. I was talking with a, a neighbor, we were talking to some neighbors this week, and uh, the, the husband did this. Uh, we were talking and all of a sudden he just started telling stories and he was revisiting and remembering something that God has, had done in his life. And it was interesting to listen to him or even watch him tell the story, which he had clearly told before. But his, as he got farther into the story, you know, his eyes kind of narrowed. He got a little more convinced. He got even more convinced. He even got more excited about the story. It was, he was retelling what God had done. And you could tell that this is sitting with him. And this is a story that, that is fueling him for his life. This is remembering what God has done. So if you're into statistics and numbers, which I kind of think are interesting a lot of the time, um, there's quite a surprising comparison in this speech and in this passage. Um, in, if, this, if this was Joshua's speech to everybody as a whole pie, one half, labeled number one, one half of the speech is about this, about remembering, about repeating, about revisiting the things that God has done. I mean, he spends half of his entire speech, remembering the past and reminding them of things that God has done and the value of that promise. That's a lot of the speech. And if he spends half repeating the things that they already know, maybe it's worth remembering the things that God has done and repeating those so that they stay with us. Okay, now exercise number two comes right after one and it's exactly what I expected Joshua to say. So be very careful to follow everything Moses wrote in the book of instruction. Do not deviate from it, turning either to the right or to the left. Cling tightly to the Lord your God as you have done until now. Be very careful to love the Lord your God. You know, when we're talking about faithfulness, this is exactly what I expect. Do. Follow. Obey. You know, do the right thing. That's what I think of when I think of faithfulness. But what I love about the way that Joshua says this is he doesn't just say, follow the rules, go about the routine, get it done, check it off the list. It's not bland, it's not drab kind of faithfulness. I think he takes faithfulness to a new level in a couple ways. Uh, in one of the ways, in, in this whole context of obedience, he's talking about clinging and holding tightly to the Lord and loving God. You know, that, that moves into a promised land relational type of faithfulness. It's not just do the stuff and get it done. It's love God and cling tightly to God. In other words, the way that we obey is to show our love for God. It's, faithfulness comes in the context of a relationship. So we don't just be faithful to do it. We're faithful because we're holding tightly to God and we love God. That's where it grows out of. And then the other thing, the other way, the other step that he takes in trying to make this more of a, of a real faithfulness is he talks about being careful. You know, twice he talked about being careful. And the picture is like walking down a narrow path and there are options to go other ways. Don't go to the right, don't go to the left, but be careful to stay on that path, which takes attention. You know, it takes intentionality to be faithful. It doesn't just naturally happen, no matter how good we are, and no matter how much we hope. It takes intentionality to be faithful, to obey, to do, to follow the way that God wants us to be. Um, in our After School Bible Club, each week we've been talking about a different name for God. And the idea is, the more we get to know these different names for God, the better we get to know God Himself. So we've been working through different names, one simple name each week. And this last week we were talking about God as our judge, um, which is kind of like faithful. You know, ah, I don't want to talk about faithfulness. I don't want to talk about judge. But as Meredith taught very wisely, this means a whole different thing. So as we're talking about God as our judge in the small group at least that I 
got to be part of. Um, this fourth grader, I think she is, uh, in, just in the middle of our conversation about God as judge, she says, um, Ten Commandments. Okay, what, what does that mean? What do you have in mind? And she said, are the Ten Commandments in the Bible? And I said, well, yes. So after we finished our short conversation about something else, I said, well, open your Bibles to Exodus. And let's flip to chapter 20. And they all, they all flipped there, and we all got there. And I said, well, let's just scan through the passage. What do you see? And they're like, it's the Ten Commandments. And it was like they heard of it, but to actually see it in the Bible, they're like, oh, this is really in the Bible. And they're seeing God's rules and God's laws, and they got excited about commandments. I mean, this is good to be excited about being faithful and doing the things that God gives us to do. It takes work, it takes intentionality, but it's within a relationship with God. Okay, now exercise number three. Um, if Joshua was a circuit speaker, you know, somebody who had a job, who was really on the map, getting asked to do speeches and being invited to places to do speeches, he would have been, I think, fine with exercise one and exercise two. People would have supported that and said, okay, keep going, Joshua, you're on. We'll, we'll give you your paycheck at the end of the speech. It's exercise three that I think he would have been thrown out and fired for. Because we all know when you get a speech, you gotta you gotta end on what kind of note? Oh, oh yeah, a high note. You gotta end on something good. You gotta motivate people, push them out the door and say, come on people, let's go, let's get this done. Joshua does not do that. So here's how Joshua finishes. But if you turn away from the Lord and cling to the customs of the survivors of these nations remaining among you, and if you intermarry with them, then know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out of your land. Instead, they will be a snare and a trap to you, a whip for your backs and thorny brambles in your eyes, and you will vanish from this good land the Lord your God has given you. As surely as the Lord your God has given you the good things he promised, he will also bring disaster on you if you disobey him. He will completely destroy you from this good land he has given you. And that's the short version. There's a few more verses there, and I invite you to read it as a motivator to say, go and be faithful. Because that's how Joshua ends his speech. What is he doing ending there? That's not where you're supposed to end. Back to the statistics. Uh, this section, labeled number three, is not the smallest portion. It's the middle portion. It's the obey part that's the smallest. It's this part that's not the smallest part. It's just over a third of this whole section. So what's the deal? Why do we talk about a snare and a trap and disaster and destroying and removal from the land and all this not happy stuff? Why? More than, more than that, didn't we just talk about obedience? I mean, didn't we just talk about, didn't Joshua just talk about obey, do, do these things, follow God in these ways, because that's, that's how to be faithful? I mean, why, isn't it enough to just obey? Isn't it enough to do these things and be intentional about doing these things? No. Joshua would say, no, it's not. Um, for the past few years, um, our family has dabbled in golf. And I will say dabbled because um, we are not professional golfers by any means. But we've had fun learning golf. Largely that's been at the motivation of William and Madeline because they kind of got into golf. And William has certainly stuck with it more, even now being the most intentional since he's taking lessons playing golf. Uh, but we've gotten into golf and we've played fairly frequently. Um, and as we've played, we've tried to improve. Granted, the last year has maybe been the most improvement, but we've tried to improve. And, and it's interesting, you know, watching uh, golf technique videos or asking people for tips or practicing at golf, you know, there's so many details to golf, which is interesting because I, I didn't imagine golf to be that hard. You know, there aren't that many rules. You hit the ball toward the pin. Uh, I didn't imagine it would be that difficult because the ball doesn't actually move when you're hitting it. It's the only sport where the ball doesn't move on contact. So it can't be that difficult to play golf, right? Okay, so what I find interesting
interesting is when, at least for me, when I'm trying to play golf, and I'm, I'm setting up for a shot, as I'm standing there, you know, setting up for a shot, I'm thinking about so many things. And, and what's in my mind is, you know, grip and body position and your shaft lean and do you often clubs and all these things I've heard from other people and you know, back angle and, uh, and, and, and the light of my toes toward the flag and all these different things that are, are in my mind. There are just as many things in my mind of what to do as there are of, you know, don't do that. And that's where Joshua is going with this whole section. Because it's not enough to be faithful to say, this is the stuff that I got to do. It's also, I got to avoid doing this stuff. Because it takes a lot of effort to both do, but also it takes a lot of effort not to do. And we're not fully faithful unless we don't do these sorts of things. And remember, this is all in the context of God wanting us to, to be blessed in this relationship with Him. And God says, the way that you're going to be blessed is to do these things, but also, don't do that. It's just not worth it. It's not what I've designed for you. So if you don't do those things, you're going to feel this relationship. If you do do those things, you're not going to get it. God wants us to be there. And part of that is taking effort, exercising, and not doing the good things that God has given us to do. That's exercise number three. Not disobeying God's good ways. Um, Joshua makes clear that the things God promises are good. And that the land that God has for us is good. The lands that we move into, the places we spend our time, are good. And that there's ways to be faithful in those lands. Remembering and obeying and not disobeying in God's land. So, you know, each day, each week, each season, I would love for us to be able to look back and be able to say, you know what, in that, in that land, in that place I was, in that situation, I was faithful. And sometimes it's going to be remembering and keeping strong God's, God's good things that He's done for us. Sometimes it's just saying, I'm going to do this and I'm resolved to do it. Sometimes it's going to say, I'm not going to do that. And it takes a whole lot of work not to do that. But that's how we get to experience the relationship that God's designed for us. So, let's go out and exercise. Let's pray.